Hey, everybody. Welcome back. This is the Gestalt IT Rundown. We are live here on a beautiful day before Thanksgiving here in the US of A. If you're watching internationally, it's known as Wednesday. Uh, my name is Rich Straffolino. I'm uh, the content manager with Gestalt IT. And I'm joined, as always, by Tom Hollingsworth across cyberspace. Uh, Tom, how are you? I'm pretty good. I've been drinking about four gallons of coffee today to ward off the uh, tryptophan coma from Turkey tomorrow. So if I get a little spastic on the episode, you'll know why. I've actually consumed about a gallon of eggnog already. So <laughs> if I like blow up like a, a Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory child at some point, uh, that is the reason why. But we are here to discuss the IT news of the week. Now, going into kind of a holiday week is a little bit on the slower side, but we had some some pretty big announcements, uh, announcements, rulings, decisions, uh, other words that have meanings. And so we're going to run through them right now. Tom, are you ready to get going on this? Let's do this. Okay, so the big kind of news, uh, I think, um, on, a, on a larger scale, is the FCC has formally announced uh, plans to roll back existing net neutrality uh, rules under Title II, uh, which had previously been set up by Tom Wheeler's uh, FCC administration uh, a few years ago, I think two years ago now. Um, and uh, what the uh, kind of the the plan here is to kind of hand off uh, net neutrality complaints to the FTC, uh, try and encourage the, the argument would be to instead of doing a more top heavy um, uh, common carrier approach uh, to regulation with ISPs to try and generate a more uh, market driven approach, encourage more competition uh, and and kind of ensure net neutrality. If that's something consumers want, they will shift their dollars that way. Not so much concerned about the consumer side of this. That gets uh, very political very quickly. So people have opinions one way or the other. Um, I don't know. I don't think it should be a partisan issue, but whatever. Of On an enterprise level or from an IT level, Tom, what does this kind of shift in how net neutrality is going to be regulated and enforced or lack thereof uh, mean to you? Well, um, let me ask you a real quick question. Um, how would you feel if you were going to move your entire business workload to the cloud or are already in the process of doing it and your ISP comes back and says, oh, it's going to be an extra $15 a month for the VPN that does the keep alive between your two boxes? Or what if they're just going to charge you an extra $35 a month for any traffic that's headed for Amazon's cloud services? Well, do you think that that's fair competition? Do you think that you should be subsidizing service provider networks um, because they are obviously not spending money on them? You know, that that that's a really interesting point. But on the other hand, if I was to get um, a more uh, a harder SLA uh, with more guarantees as a result, maybe of that, I don't know if a lot of companies would really raise a big stink. Um, I, I think, though, that you raise a really good point, though, um, if for public cloud providers, you know, if I'm Amazon, if I'm Microsoft, I don't know what this is going to mean because, you know, I've been counting on, you know, hey, these pipes are just going to carry my packets and we can do cloud awesomeness. Um, now, am I going to have to, you know, pay for better peering agreements with an ISP? And, you know, how is it, you know, is that, is that going to affect uh, the endpoint traffic? I, that to me is, I think, the big question on where uh, the public cloud providers are going to fall in this whole debate. And if you think the public cloud isn't big enough to warrant that kind of uh, scrutiny, look at what happened with Verizon and Netflix three years ago when Verizon was essentially arguing that Netflix was abusing their um, abusing their business model by uh, carrying way more traffic than they needed to. Uh, there was a huge fight over uh, placement of devices in Netflix, or Netflix wanting to place devices in Verizon data centers. Um, that whole issue with the cross connects where Verizon refused to plug in four three foot ethernet cables to relieve stress on a load. Um, Netflix fought back with some kind of a pop-up on their service saying, hey, if you're on Verizon, we're sorry that things suck, but so does Verizon. Uh, lawsuits were threatened. Um, magically agreements were negotiated that that you know there was a little bit of a price increase on Netflix's side but how long is it going to be before Verizon decides that that's best for their business model to do it to Azure or Google Cloud yeah that that's where it gets really interesting and i guess the the argument on the other side would be that uh i, I mean again you you at least have in public cloud providers you know i mean that's that's a big problem though for you know if if probably don't have uh, uh, like a high capacity ISP, like that many to choose from. Um, I remember for a law firm I worked for, like it was a huge deal when like Windstream 
was available in uh, Solon, Ohio. And all of a sudden, you know, we could we could choose to, you know, get faster, more, uh, more reliable service, just, you know, the way uh, uh, competition had shaped up. So, you know, you know, if you only have the choice between two, I don't have some very major impacts. It'll, it'll be interesting to see um, if they can shape policy. Now, I will say it it is uh, notable that prior to the uh, the Title II regulations that the FCC uh, put in place a couple of years ago, wide scale uh, uh, net neutrality violations. You know, I think it was Comcast got in trouble for throttling BitTorrent traffic. Um, some some smaller cases here or there. You can you know you can argue whether um, you know zero rating certain services qualifies as uh, as net neutrality violations. You know, the bigger point is that there wasn't a big net neutrality uh, conspiracy that the FCC was uh, thwarting with these rules that existed at that time. Now, I think that, you know, the landscape has changed. Like we said, public cloud is is huge in the enterprise. It's only going to get bigger. There's a really big incentive there to try and extract as much value as you can. If you're an ISP that's not competing in that space, you know, it's a very different landscape, even just on an enterprise level, not even from a consumer level. So we'll see where it goes from there. Yep. All right, uh, Tom, this one uh, I think strikes near and dear to your heart. We finally had Broadcom closing in on the brocade acquisition for $5.5 billion. When I first started with Gestalt IT, I think this literally just happened. It's like every week there's like one tiny little piece of the brocade Broadcom deal finally falls into place. It's all over now. What exactly did Broadcom get? What did they have to sell off? And, you know, how does this... How does this shape of the landscape? Not the the acquisition's been completed. Well, it's funny because that when you when you hear about the deal, you hear that it's huge and it's land, it's groundbreaking. All Broadcom really got was the old brocade fiber channel chipset assets. Um, they didn't get a huge um, that what we know of as uh, broad brocade, which was parts of Foundry and McData and Ruckus. Um, it, it, so they got Broadcom themselves got the chipset stuff, which is what they wanted because it's the synergy with with their, with their stuff. Um, they had to sell off the wireless assets that they got from Ruckus to Eris, which um, most people in the country know Eris. If you have one of those wireless cable modem things, it was probably made by Eris. Um, AT and T ended up buying the software router assets that were acquired through Viata. Um, Extreme Networks ended up buying the data center networking pieces, which some of those came from Foundry Networks and other ones were home developed like uh, Stackstorm, which a couple of our friends from Tech Field Day work at. And um, let's see here. Uh, some other various bits and pieces ended up getting shuffled around. So, I mean, yes, Broadcom bought Brocade, but they didn't buy a lot of Brocade. Uh, Brocade is going to live on seeding other companies in other places. <laughs> Now, does, uh, you know, obviously it was uh, Broadcom, you know, didn't want to uh, uh, compete in businesses where they didn't necessarily have any synergy, uh, which is, you know, a reason for a lot of these, uh, a lot of these sell-offs. Um, do you think this, the, the finally closing of this deal lays any groundwork for the, you know, uh, rumored or potential acquisition of Qualcomm? by Broadcom. I mean, obviously it's a much huger scale. It's a, like a 20 time bigger dollar amount uh, in terms of an acquisition. But do you think like if, you know, one, if Broadcom is able to raise the money and two, if they're able to, you know, maybe promise to divest uh, some assets, do you think that's the path forward for that? Or is, I mean, obviously um, substantially different companies. You know, I don't really know that this is going to affect that that acquisition at all. I mean, the only thing that I might see is if Qualcomm is a U.S. company versus um, being an international company, maybe the moving of the headquarters of Broadcom into the U.S. to um, skirt some negotiations might make that a little bit different. But then, of course, now it becomes a DOJ issue. They, they want to, you know, make sure there are no monopolies or competition crushing, which obviously there would be in this kind of scenario. Um, I, I don't think brocade is too big of a thing for Broadcom to digest quickly and move on. Um, so maybe they are going to uh, pony up. Now, I don't think they're going to have to divest any assets, to be honest with you, because um, fiber channel is a maintenance market right now. Uh, people that are using it are going to keep using it. People who aren't using it aren't going to buy into it. Okay. Well, we'll, uh, we'll see if... Uh you know, how that, uh, how that shakes up. But thank God I finally have to stop writing follow-up pieces on Gestalt IT that, uh, you know, uh, Ruckus is now, you know, wherever, you know, mm -hmm. I, 
can just move on with our new Broadcom centric life. Um, it, it kind of a weird story came up. Like I said, it's a, it's a weird news week uh, this week. Uh, a little bit of a uh, uh, cryptocurrency news. I'm really fascinated monetization schemes with Bitcoin, not just using it, you know, in place of a, a fiat currency, you know, just using a Bitcoin to, you know, buy a computer or something like that. That's boring. That's like the most table stakes uh, cryptocurrency thing out there. What's really interesting to me is of using, um, you, you know, the the old saying is, if you're getting something for free, you know, what what you're the product basically, right? So if you're mm -hmm. seeing, if you're reading an article for free on the internet, tracked and they're selling that information uh you're seeing ads which are you know your attention is is kind of paying for that um if you're you know if, if you're behind a paywall you know the wall street journal you're paying with money it, kind of a weird movement in the not a weird i don't know it's weird to me uh moving the cryptocurrency movement to pay with your cpu mm -hmm. for uh different content so we've seen a number of javascript miners uh kind of uh, uh set up web page it starts mining with this little javascript applet that takes a thread or two up from your cpu uh mines a tiny little bit of uh, crypto that goes back to the provider of the content and your cpu gets a little hotter and your energy bill goes up by like 0.001 cents you know for every minute that you're on there or something like that so now uh there was a company called coin hive got into some trouble because their javascript mining thing doesn't pop up and let you know that it's doing it and companies were using it. You know, they they weren't doing it, but they were getting really bad PR because other companies were doing it. Well, now there's a there's a browser maker called Brave that's taking that business model and making it basically the entire purpose of their browser, right? So what they will do is you specify on certain sites, will mine crypto, and then you know, the site provider, you can notify them. And the site provider can sign up and get that deposited, you know, into a into a, a virtual wallet uh, of some form. I'm not sure if they're using. Um, I know CoinHive uses Monero. I'm not sure what the Brave browser is using. But Tom, the idea of using your CPU with your knowledge to pay for content that you're consuming is that of interest to you? Uh, it is honestly. If it means that I can get rid of um, pop up ads, flash ads, tracking scripts. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I run an ad blocker and ghostery and all those other things. It's not that I don't want people to be able to pay for their content. It's that I want to get rid of all of the unseen crap that's running in the background. So yeah, if if someone's running a cryptocurrency miner and a JavaScript thing and they didn't pop up and tell me that, yeah, I might be a little bit peeved. But if you're collecting four or five megabytes of information about me with every page load that I still didn't see the pop-up for, I'm going to be a little more irritated. So this just goes back to the, you know, the ideas of like SETI at home and folding at home. It's like, hey, CPU is not doing anything. Why don't we use it for a little bit of stuff? As long as it doesn't impact the page loads, I'm fine. But I would like to be notified that that's going on. And my, my reservations about the usefulness of cryptocurrency notwithstanding, if this is a way for people to get money to keep their sites going, so be it. Yeah, we, we seem to be in a renaissance for like weird ways to monetize stuff. Like I, I think we've, I don't know, we certainly haven't hit, hit peak advertising because I can still see content when I visit a site, but we're getting close. Like what I'm, I, like the scroll through ads are the absolute worst. Um, yeah. I was just complaining about ZDNet that they have videos pop up. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, a lot of new sites autoplay video is just the absolute worst. And I have to imagine that, you know, if, if, you're being conservative and you're only using a thread or two that can't be more impactful on my system performance than having a video load, you know, an HD video load in the background yeah. and all of a sudden just start blaring stuff at me. I, I, I do think the challenge is one, figuring out a way to, you know, let people know what's going on. And, and two, like you said, when it does start impacting performance, there has to be a way to intelligently dial that back, which I think is a limitation of all of these systems right now. It is kind of interesting though, that we, you know, um, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's very much an efficiency issue, right? That you just have the CPU that's sitting there at, you know, 20% utilized when you're browsing the web for the most part, unless you're hitting an autoplay video and trying to find a way to maximize that, you know, you're already paying for the electricity that's going through there. Yeah, it might go up a little bit, but uh, uh, finding a way to use that, I think is, is a super interesting project.
Yeah, just uh, be aware that if you're uh, if you're buying into this, there's a possibility that your uh, IT people could set up a website with cryptocurrency miner in the background and go set all of the home pages for all of the enterprise machines to hit that home page so that it'll write mine currency. Um, people are really creative when it comes to ways to fleece uh, <laughs> the the system. Are you know that that is an interesting uh, question. You know, does that then become uh, you know who who does that fall under? Because uh, you obviously, I don't think you would see like a ton of network traffic. Obviously, be going. You know, the miner is running locally, and it's just shooting out the math when it's done uh, back there. So it would be interesting to see uh, <laughs> if uh, that becomes a major issue uh, with business. You know, the, the local IT admin just plugs something in, um, kind of like a weird pen test in in a, in a certain way. Hmm. Who knows? Kind of the big story in, a, in an IT sense, obviously, the net neutrality has a lot of implications, you know, across society, potentially, whatever. Uh, but the, in, in IT news, I think one of the big story that just came out, I think, yesterday is that Meg Whitman is officially stepping down uh, as the CEO of Hewlett Packard Enterprise. The, this is not a surprise uh, when she was hired on in 2011. Uh, she had said this was you know, kind of a five year project and had agreed to stay on. She had interviewed as a courtesy for the Uber job, although I'm sure if they offered it to her with bags and bags of cash, uh, she, you know, uh, how courteous uh, she was in considering that. Um, but, you know, now uh, definitely stepping down, we're going to have Antonio Neri, uh, who's been with HPE for 23 years, stepping in as CEO Feb effective February 1st of next year. Um, so, Tom, I'm kind of interested. What do you think uh, when we look back at Meg Whippin in a couple of years, is going to be you know the the legacy achievement is it the split with hp and hp i mean that's obviously like the the big news item that people think of from her tenure um but i don't know if that reflects all that great on her considering you know hp is kind of outdoing hp in terms of uh you know company growth well i mean this it's so weird to look back on this because you know like you said in 2011 the story wasn't that that we had a female ceo of a a major company with the the implications of the split coming it was oh my god i hope meg does a better job than the last two guys because when you look at when you say the legacy of people you've got mark hurd who basically turned r d into some kind of really weird dungeon and they <laughs> they didn't do anything then you had leo apotheker and yeah autonomy uh, literally the only the the word that follows his name from now for the rest of his life is autonomy and they took a bath on that and i'm actually happy to see hp inc doing a lot more business than hpe even though near and dear in my heart because i'm an enterprise guy and because i know a lot of friends that work at now hpe both you know aruba nimble storage simplicity uh, acquisitions um, HP Inc. basically got all the debt in that deal. They are, if they're making money hand over fist and, and they've kind of sorted out that debt situation, more power to them. But yeah, you're right. Meg was never going to be, you know, the, the Tom Watson of HPE. She wasn't going to be the John Chambers. She wasn't going to stick around forever. Uh, Meg has other things that she wants to do. And, and maybe the fact that she got interviewed for Uber kind of tells you what Meg's specialty is, which is cleaning up messes that people are uh, responsible for and they get sacked. Um, Antonio's going to do a good job. He's been doing a really good job behind the scenes of, of positioning things. Um, I'm going to be really interested to see kind of if they're going to start slowing down a little bit more. Uh, they, you know, they've had some pretty big acquisitions as of late, but they don't seem to be complementary acquisitions. Um, Simplicity is kind of an addition to some of the stuff they're offering. I get the feeling that Nimble Storage is going to be the the nameplate going forward, given the fact that they've renamed it HPE Storage. Um, and obviously, Aruba is doing a really great job taking over the campus networking portfolio. This is not a situation with Cisco where, you know, Catalyst becomes their switching line or, you know, they rebrand this company and give it as another offering. HPE is quite literally performing major surgery on itself uh, while it's driving down the road. Uh, I can only hope that it pays off for them. Well, you know, it is it is really interesting that uh, Antonio is going to basically be the first homegrown CEO, someone that's been with the company for a number of years since Lewis Platt way back in 1999. And I have to also pour out um, some disdain for uh, Leo uh, Apotheker. Is that right? Um, because he did kill uh, WebOS. Uh, he will always have yeah. my disdain for that. Um, but even though um, Herd bought 
you know, bought it from, uh, or basically bought Palm, but, uh, yeah. Yeah. The, Damn you, Leo. Yeah. Well, I mean, he, he was a services guy. He oh. was a software guy and, and he, yeah. but, Oh yeah. No, as soon as he came in, you knew it was dead. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's there. That was a really weird synergy. I mean, when you look back on it though, boy, that would have really paid off if somebody had made something happen with it. So, but, but I guess my question is with Antonio, is this, is, is it a sign that they're, they're going from the HPE bench? Is this a sign that, Hey, this guy knows the business. He knows what direction he, he knows where we're already, where, where, where we've made key acquisitions, where our business is strong, you know, where we can make great margins, where we can, where we have room to expand. He like, we don't have to, there's no training that has to be involved. He's not going to go take us off into a weird direction. Is it, is slowly turning we're you know we're going to be a new slimmer more agile if you know we're going to use some buzzwords here uh hpe going forward and he's the guy that already knows the direction he's he continuous in that direction or is it um you know we don't know we don't know who wants this job we don't you know we're not sure where, we're not sure where we're going so we're going to go off the bench like does that signal anything to you that they're going with well if you look you know, at it's been there for two decades if you look at these off the bench promotions, uh, Chuck Robbins, Tim Cook, uh, Jenny Romady, um, they all have something in common. Um, obviously, with a little bit of, of hindsight, they're not people that rock the boat. They're not going to go out and, you know, like you said, spend billions of dollars to buy a new line of business like Leo did with with autonomy. They're going to look at what they've got. They're going to keep it running, and and you know maybe. I've always said, and this especially pertains to sports like college football, you never want to be the manager that follows the legend because um, you're going to get buried in what they consider mediocrity when, in fact, you're actually succeeding beyond your wildest dreams. But folks like Tim Cook and and now uh, Antonio Neri, they're not following, quote unquote, the legend in their own way. What they're doing is they're just keeping the ship sailing. And, and their biggest hope, honestly, is if they go six or seven years is to retire with a slightly higher stock price and basically be forgotten to the footnotes of history. Kind of like uh, whoever the guy that took over Apple from Steve Jobs was before he took it back. A, it, I, astute observation, Tom. I couldn't have uh, said it better myself. Yeah, no, it like, yeah, HPE is not going to be this. I mean, you know, like, again, we, we've had this discussion uh, specifically involving, you know, some some of their uh, uh, different networking lines. Like, these are stable businesses. They're completely unexciting. They'll keep making money and they can keep doing it and not change anything uh, if they really want to. Um, I, I do think, you know, like like you said, this seems like a like a, a long term pick. This seems like again, guy knows the business. He's not gonna he's not gonna screw it up. Like, yeah, don't screw this up is basically um, uh, what we're gonna see. Do you think there's gonna be any uh, uh, you know considering he's gonna be continuing kind of the trend where HP is going? Any kind of signal of what maybe the next spinoff is gonna be for their business? Just out of curiosity, kind of get on that note. Oh man, that's a tough one to call because they've been spinning out pieces left and right. Um, I think he's going to stick with hardware though. I think that you won't see any hardware pieces spun out or or anything like that. And, and honestly, I would not be surprised to see some small acquisitions in those spaces. Um, I still think that Aruba is going after an SD-WAN provider in this coming year. Um, who it's going to be will be a very interesting discussion point. But I think that, that you'll see as, that. as we've discussed, there are fewer and fewer of them. To choose. <laughs> That's absolutely true. Um, but yeah, I don't I don't see blockbuster deals in Antonio's future. Um, you, I may even see some partnership stuff. Now they could prove me wrong and go buy Arista in March, but you know, who knows? <laughs> oh man, I can't wait to write all the pieces about how long that's going to take to close. All right, well, that's going to get us out of here for the Gestalt IT Rundown. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. We'll have this posted up on Gestalt IT as kind of its own video, uh, but we're live every Wednesday from around 1230 Eastern. Uh, so uh, continue to check us out. Subscribe to our YouTube page if you don't want to miss it and get a notification. You can also check out if you're into the podcast thing. Uh, we have the on-premise IT Roundtable. We just had a new episode post on Tuesday all about scale out storage. And the premise of that episode was, hey, all storage should scale out, you dumb dumb. That's not <laughs> that was my personal edition. Um, so uh, you can check that out. And uh, also on Gestalt IT, I just put together our holiday gift guide for this year. So if you're heading out uh, for some shopping this uh, this coming week, uh, hitting up some, some Black Friday deals, make sure you check that out uh, beforehand. Spoiler alert. 
There was a mouse pad and a mini play on it. So some pretty hot stuff. Um, so until next time we meet, Tom, thank you so much for your time as always. Uh, and we'll uh, see everybody next week. Thanks a lot.